All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining again this week. Um, this week, we're going to chat about uncovering pain points. We're going to talk about using compelling questions and statements to get better at really highlighting what these pain points are and helping customers really get their biggest concern to the surface as early as possible so that we can do a better job at helping them. Uh, getting started here, feel free to throw your um, name and where you are in the chat. Uh, introduce yourself to the group. That's always fun. Um, next, I want to kind of get right into this topic because it's a lot of um, information to cover in a very, very short period of time. So many reasons why these compelling questions are going to be used in a business. But ultimately, what we really want are questions that we're so familiar with that they just kind of roll off the tongue when we're meeting with prospects and um, people who have you know, either reached out to us looking for a quote or people that we just want to seek out and get the opportunity to even provide proposals and quotes for. So ultimately what we're trying to do is just to find out how we can help them. And I often say this about sales, you know, sales is really all about just helping other people. And I think the best salespeople see it that way. They just, they don't consider sales as being something uh, self-serving. They see it as actually serving others. And when you get really, really good at sales, what you're best at is just finding out how you can help other people. So these questions are all about figuring out what their pain points are or what it is that they're looking for so that you can help them better than your competitors. And I really truly believe that the landscape company who has the best questions when meeting with prospects is likely to be able to sell better. Now, there's a reason for that. These compelling questions that we ask give us the opportunity to use compelling statements to explain to them how we can help them as we uncover the pain points that they might have in their day to day, if they're a homeowner or in their business, if they're a commercial client. And so what we're really trying to do here is just figure out what their pain is and then tell them how we can help them solve it. So these compelling questions are super important for many, many reasons. Ultimately, we're trying to find out what the pain point is. We're trying to ask really thoughtful questions to figure out what that pain is. And the reason we want to have the questions prepared in advance and kind of know what our go-to questions are so that we ask them in a way where they land well with that specific customer type. So last week, we covered the ideal customer profile. Today, I'm going to refer to that ideal customer profile as ICP. So if I'm saying ICP, you know that that's your ideal customer profile. So when we try to focus on different types of customers, we want to create different types of questions so that they land better within that specific ICP. And you may have multiple uh, customer profiles in your business. One could be a residential homeowner who's looking for landscape maintenance. Another could be a residential homeowner who wants a beautiful backyard swimming pool. Another could be a commercial client in an industrial car parts plant who's looking for snow plowing. And, you know, polar opposite could be a homeowners association with a thousand homes that need snow plowing. And so for each of those customer profiles, they have different pain points and as we kind of think about ICP development and really honing in on which customers look uh, similar and then creating profiles, what that allows us to do is then build these questions out. So once you've built out your ICP, according to last week's um, webinar that we did here, it's important to be able to kind of think about building out these really good questions that are going to highlight the pain and allow you to drop these powerful statements or these compelling statements to explain to them exactly how you're uh, going to solve that problem for them. 
So these questions allow us to build trust. Ultimately, what we're trying to do, everybody knows that people buy from people that they either know, like, or trust, or ideally all three. And so what we're trying to do is, is build a, a relationship. And these questions are so thoughtful and they're so natural for this type of customer because we know our customer profiles that we get to, and I stress, we get to build relationships and solve their problems. And so as salespeople, what we're trying to do is just understand them. And the questions have to be designed in a way where they feel comfortable talking about the issue that they're facing and the problem they're trying to solve. And ideally what happens is as these questions uh, land, trust develops. And I think we all know this kind of instinctively, you know, you trust people who have good questions because they ob obviously understand you when they ask a question that is relatable. And you can all, you know, sort of imagine times in your life when somebody's asked you weird questions that don't really make sense to you. Immediately, you lose interest in that conversation or that person and you're um, uncomfortable enough to want to move on to, to a new conversation. And so these questions just have to land in a way where it feels natural, where it seems like you almost know what this customer wants before they even speak. And obviously, um, we're all consumers, we buy things. And when we start to deal with any salesperson who seems to just know what we're looking for, momentum builds and we get to the buy a lot faster. So sometimes what I try to do is put myself in both sides of this equation. And that's kind of one of the best parts about uncovering pain points using these power questions we actually get to build a set of questions that we can use for uh, role play training with other people in the company. And if you're a small company, maybe you're gonna do this with a friend or with a partner. Uh, if you're a big company and there's many salespeople, you can choose a sales buddy. In any case, I think what you want though is somebody to work with and sort of trade these questions back and forth because when you're in the sales role of role playing, you're practicing what you do every day. And when you're in the customer role, you're also practicing because you actually get the opportunity to be the customer and feel their side of the conversation and actually sort of, I guess, learn uh, what feels good and what doesn't. And it helps you become a little bit more empathetic to their side of the conversations that you're having. Because I think, you know, it is easy as salespeople to get frustrated with some of the behaviors of the people we sell to. But at the same time, I think it's important to understand the other side and just how it feels when you're getting maybe grilled with questions that feel a little one sided. And so this is all about building conversation. The best part about these questions is each time you ask a question, you get to come back with a statement. And so when you ask a question that's kind of, I don't know, gonna give you an answer that you're expecting, then you get this opportunity to just drop this powerful statement that builds trust, that positions you as the expert or the trusted advisor. And really, I think kind of just takes the conversation to a new level. And what we're trying to do is just keep building uh, momentum by asking better and better questions that get us closer and closer to a close of some sort. And when I say a close, that could be many different things. If it's the first meeting on a design build, maybe I'm trying to close the design sale so that I get the opportunity to design a project and put together a full proposal. On a cold call on a snow contract to a commercial customer, my first close might be just simply a cold call getting a meeting. And so the close is just getting the meeting and so on. And so there's different questions needed at different um, phases of the sale, as you can imagine. But ultimately what we're trying to do is come up with questions that really truly differentiate us from the others that they're speaking to at any given phase of a sale. So when they get the first contractor to show up to look at the backyard pool and they don't have as good of questions and you walk in second or third, something feels very, very different. 
Um, ideally, you've got a better portfolio and a better website and a nicer truck. But the reality is, is your ability to connect to that customer really does rely on your conversation skills. And I think this is where a lot of companies who are scaling really start to suffer. Um, sometimes the owner operator is just kind of naturally talented at having these conversations. And maybe it's through, you know, experience, or maybe it's even just, you know, survive or die kind of mindset. I have to be good at this because I have to pay the bills. But the reality is, is like oftentimes more experienced sellers could be the owner operator, could be even somebody in the company who's been doing selling for a long time. They have these questions that they ask. And as the sales team starts to scale, sometimes this doesn't get documented in a way where it's really repeatable. But I will say that the companies that really focus on developing this as a system and then training this as a system always have more success. Ultimately, what we're trying to do with the questions is create really valuable um, information sets that we use in order to kind of push things to the next level. So we ask a question, we get an answer. With that answer, we build upon it until we get to a yes. But all the while, we're trying to ultimately make sure that we let them know how we help them. So if you're selling snow plowing, for example, and you're out asking a quick question about how important snow plowing is to them and what happens to their business in the case that it snows, like what happens around here if it snows and what would happen if you had a service interruption with your snow plowing provider. And when we get that answer, we know how important snow is to them. And then we can build upon that by starting to ask more specific questions that allow us to keep adding more and more value throughout our Q&A. So what we always want to be able to do as we sort of get through these questions is as we're dropping our power statements or our compelling statements on the prospect, we want to find a way to drive a little urgency to kind of keep this deal rolling forward. And so when we build out our compelling statements, we really want to make sure that we've got as much um, tooling built into our statements as possible to create that sense of urgency. So it's July and August. Ideally, if you're in the snow business, you're out selling snow right now. Maybe one of the key things is letting them know that you'd like to really get a, an opportunity to meet with them in July to review their needs because in August, you like to put out all of your final proposals. And in September, you really do set your route for the year and you make sure that everybody is uh, planned, that you've got your equipment, that you've got everything in order. So your urgency is, we're on a timeline here. We really wanna work with you this year, but we really do have to get this meeting done here in July so that we can review the contract and the pricing and the proposal and get you in the queue by the end of August so that we plan for servicing your property properly throughout September and October, and we're ready for the snow to hit. Whatever that case is, any one of your ICPs is going to have to have a different sense of urgency. And that's why it's so important to create ICP. If it's a backyard swimming pool, obviously you've got limited schedule. Um, we can only build so many pools in a year. If it's snow plowing, the scenario I just talked about. If it's commercial landscape maintenance, we could talk about the um, availability of the crews in that area of the city. We've got a block open. I'd really love to get um, this uh, scheduled in for you. And so we need that sense of urgency for any specific ICP that we're servicing. Some examples here that I'll cover of different types of uh, questions. And obviously we have to choose an ICP at some point. These are fairly high level. What I'm doing right here is just trying to highlight for you the type of questions um, without getting into an ICP. So fairly generic, these first few examples. I'll go a little bit deeper with a, with a more uh, specific example following this, but ultimately when you're trying to come up with these compelling questions for each ICP, what I'd really advise you to do is try to figure out questions that land well and position you as an expert first, uh, 
we have to just find out what their challenges or immediate needs are. And so depending on if this is a commercial customer, if it's snow, if it's landscape maintenance, if it's a residential customer with a, that wants weekly maintenance, there's very different challenges and needs. And that's why we need an ICP is to understand what those needs are likely to be so that these questions land in a way where they feel like we understand them. So first and foremost, we just want to understand what their immediate need is, what their challenges are in their business or in their home um, so that we can kind of understand the basics. Then we're going to build off of that. And what we're going to what we're going to move to next looks like our numbers are out of order here on this slide deck. Um, what we're going to move to next is going to be the impact and the consequences of not having this problem dealt with right away. So again, different questions based on the ICP, but ultimately, hey, what happens if we don't serve this contract appropriately? If you don't move forward with a contract, what's going to happen? Or in the case of snow plowing, oftentimes I'll say something along the lines of, hey, could you just let me know how the business would be impacted if the snow plowing wasn't managed really efficiently during a snow event? That's a great way for them just to talk about it. Or you could say, hey, in the past, have you ever had a service interruption and what was the impact that that had on the business? So we're just trying to find a, a, a way of, I guess, helping the prospect think of the pain associated with um, this problem not being solved, but also we want to understand what that impact would look like so that we can build better questions as we roll forward. And so I think it kind of becomes natural to start talking about their overall goals and objectives for the coming year. And again, whether it's a homeowner and they're just looking to build this beautiful backyard retreat, or whether it's a homeowner looking to have someone take the pain away of having to maintain the property every week, or maybe it's a big commercial contract where they actually have a, a business um, risk if we don't serve the property. We need to figure that out. And so goals and objectives come into play very quickly. Us being confident about asking the prospect what their priorities are and ultimately what success would look like. Like what does this year really look like for you if we solve this problem? And there's very various ways of asking this question depending on the ICP. And that's why it's so important to rehearse these and to have this built out as a sales playbook so that we ask really good questions because we, we know that we wanna figure out what their goals or objectives are, but there's a very different way of asking that depending on the ICP that we're facing. Uh, compelling power questions around decision-making is another key um, component. So we definitely want to understand what it, the decision making process looks like. And it, again, with a homeowner, we always know who the decision maker is. It's going to be, you know, one of the two people that own the home uh, or both, ideally both. <laughs> um, but generally speaking, we know what that process looks like. When it's commercial contract though it's really difficult for us to figure this out it's not as simple as just simply saying um the person we're speaking with must be the decision maker certainly they're going to be an influence but we don't always know who the decision maker is and so i think it's really good to get um very specific questions around the the decision making process uh for each icp and then also like a way of pulling that information out in a natural way where it doesn't really create um, an uncomfortable feeling for the prospect. And again, all of these compelling power questions are meant to be conversational. We don't want to use it like a survey. We don't want to question people like a firing squad. We simply want to be able to move through a conversation and surface these five areas to really get good at understanding the need and really kind of finding out what we need to know and fact finding in a way where we can then educate. And so each question gives us an opportunity to come back with an educational compelling statement, one that positions us as that trusted advisor, that expert, that consult, uh, consultative approach to selling. 
Um, the last one that I really think is, is important to be good at is getting the prospect talking about past experiences um, and, you know, maybe even creating a little bit of um, a reminder about how maybe they've tried to solve this in the past, but they haven't solved it entirely. And this is really common with any recurring maintenance activity, whether it's snow or maintenance. I think the better you are at understanding what they've done in the past and whether or not that satisfied the need that they had really allows you to kind of come over the top with this really powerful statement that explains how you would solve their problem differently. So past experience and their level of satisfaction is a really powerful way to kind of end. And so as we get to number five, and, and hopefully we're going to be able to have these conversations really naturally and not one, two, three, four, five necessarily. But ultimately what we want to do is land on this one toward the end because it gives us the opportunity to really pivot into here's what we have to offer. Does that sound like something you're interested in? And so regardless of the ICP, we want to kind of figure out um, this type of information as we get a little bit later. Future vision and aspirations, as we kind of talk through our power statement, it's like, hey, if we could do this, how would that be for you? This is like us painting the future because ultimately where we're really trying to uh, end in our pitch is here's your problem. We know what it is. Here's what we think the future could look like if you do business with us. And the better we are at doing that and getting people to this goal line, the more likely we are to close the type of business that we're really interested in having. The final thing that we always have to talk about inevitably is budget. And so ultimately we're gonna to get to the point where we have to put a price forward. I think it's really important to get good at talking about budget. You can see it's way down the list here. And it's not something that I wanna spend a lot of time on. And I think over the years, I've heard many, many different landscapers um, ask this question, like, how do you get the budget? And uh, my answer is always the same very carefully. Um, you can see this is placed way down the list. We're not trying to figure out how much they want to spend up front. We're just trying to find out what their problems are. Then once we understand the problems and we paint a future vision, then we can say, um, let's talk about budget. Because you know, ultimately, before I put a proposal together or a design in the case of a design build job, I really do need to understand what the overall budget looks like so that I can put together the best possible proposal to suit your, your needs and um, stay within the budget that you've allocated. And so there's, a, there's an art to doing this. And for each ICP, the questions are a little bit different, obviously. And our power statements that sort of support these questions are different. But ultimately, we want, to, we want to be able to confidently talk about the budget in order to really move them along. Then all we're really left with is maybe a few objections around um, a risk that they may see or um, a fear that they might still have. And when we get to that point, I think it's much easier if we've already covered everything else to deal with these final risks and concerns. So it's definitely just kind of like almost down to a few minor little things by the time we get this late into the Q&A. And ultimately what we're trying to do then is drive urgency. And that's why it's so important to know how to drive urgency for each ICP, because ultimately what we're trying to do here is we're, we really want to just find out a way to convince them that they should act now. And I think that many, many contractors are good at doing this. And then there's others that aren't so good. And I think there's different ways to, to do this based on different uh, ideal candidate profiles or customer profiles, sorry. But we wanna make sure that we're clear on what drives urgency with each ICP and then we want to kind of utilize that as we're wrapping up the budget conversation, as we're kind of talking through those final risks, we want to start to really weave in next steps. And I think the urgency built into next steps as a conversation or as talking points is a really, really powerful way 
to, to get people over the line. Talking about exploring alternatives, you know, value engineering, this type of thing. If the budget happens to be too high, we can always um, look at other products or we can change up the design, like giving them some confidence that there's different ways of doing business, but that we're the selection selected contractor in any case, because we're just that flexible. So why do these work so well? I, I mean, if you're not convinced already, ultimately what we're trying to do is we want the customers to be able to see their problems clearly. These prospects called you or you called them on a cold call. And what we need to do is just really make sure that they clearly see what their pain point is, and then they get the opportunity to hear us describe exactly how we can help. And so it gives us an opportunity to show that we are empathetic and we are helpful and that we actually care about the problem they have. And we absolutely understand the problem that they have. And we've got a solution that's going to solve that problem. So this is just all about creating a really good dialogue, a good conversation where people can start to understand that we're the trusted advisor and really just start to feel as though their um, problem is one that we solve every day. And I think when people really understand that you solve this problem for other people just like them, they start to feel a little bit more confident. And the more conversation you have about stories about other customers or other um, scenarios that you've managed to deal with in the past that were very similar, I think you just get that prospect a little bit more engaged. And again, they open up, give you more information and always let them know that, you know, you're flexible in the way that you do business. We, we Landscaping is far too complex to solve with like one way of doing things. And so I think when you take this approach and they feel that you're in business to solve their problem and you're so flexible in the way that you go about solving it, that you're just really collecting information so that you can create this customized tailored proposal to do business the way that you need to do business in order to solve their specific problem. And I think the companies that are best at doing that always find the best customers and the companies where they've got leaders where they say, oh, no, like we only do business this way and we only write our contract this way and we only put pricing and packaging out this one specific way. I think companies like that suffer. In fact, I think they usually get stuck with the second or third tier customers because the top tier customers want their problems to be heard and they want a company who is willing to be flexible enough to solve their problems for them and charge them accordingly. And I think the better you are at describing your ability to do that, the more likely you are to close um, much, much better business. The type of business that's higher margin, people who have bigger problems and bigger risks um, are willing to pay more money and, and obviously um, they want higher levels of service and far more customized programs. So ultimately what we're trying to do is create this partnership where you've got a big problem and we've got the capability to solve it. And we need to put our minds together and truly collaborate to find out exactly how to resolve that risk and, and come up with a solution that works uh, for the specific prospect's needs. And that's really what the questions are all about. So what we're trying to do here is incorporate this stuff into our day-to-day. -day. Obviously, it has to be very specific to each ICP, but we just really want this to be kind of so natural that it just rolls off the tongue when we're meeting with prospects, ultimately leaving them with an understanding of how we help them solve their problems and an understanding that we're willing to do that in a way that's really specific to them. As I think that is what people are looking for when they're out shopping for uh, landscape maintenance services, snowplow services, a design build project or, or an enhancement project. They really have a unique problem. And the company that uh, understands how to surface that best is always going to win. So without these power questions, I think a few things happen. And these are pretty... Um, 
unfortunate but common things i think in most businesses and all too common in landscape businesses knowing that your competitors likely don't practice and likely don't have compelling questions and likely don't role play and have sales buddies and 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 a sales process that includes these questions knowing that should give you a huge boost in confidence in the sense that when you walk through the door you've got these questions that immediately build momentum and when you feel that momentum building in a sales call in a first meeting or in a a cold call even um it's pretty powerful it's it puts your confidence on another level and so where i'm going with this is without compelling questions you as the salesperson or the sales people that report to you are not going to have the confidence that they should have or need to have in order to be the winner um there's a lot to be said for just building confidence and i think that's what this does so without compelling questions we don't end up knowing what the customer really wants and we may end up selling them the wrong stuff right out we just try to sell people our standard package because we don't ask the right questions to figure out what's important to them if you start selling somebody something that's not important to them they don't like you let's just be honest if you walked into a car dealership and the car dealer uh, or the car sales person just started telling you which car that you should buy you'd be annoyed and you'd move on to another dealership pretty quickly and i think this happens a lot in landscaping people just simply showing up for a sales call and giving a price for the way that they do business or the way that they want to do business instead of the way that the prospect wants to do business what if you're not really answering all of their needs so this is a really big one by far the top of the list for me but definitely as you think about it when you go to position yourself as an expert if you just simply show up and start talking about yourself sure you can appear to know something but what if what you're explaining isn't really in line with their actual pain points and so again easy to show up and start describing yourself as an expert we can all create um talking points to make ourselves sound like we know something but it's very difficult to make sure that we're actually talking about how we solve the problems that they have if we don't even ask what those problems are and i think this happens a lot in the sales um game we want clients to know that we actually care about them enough to find out what's wrong before we start to sell Another big one is really having a hard time differentiating from competitors. And this one I hear all the time when I'm teaching workshops in person. This is where people say things like, "I don't really understand why I keep losing um every prospect or every um sales proposal to other contractors who are cheaper." And I hear this one nonstop. it's kind of like whining that's how i kind of look at this if you can't sell based on value then other people are going to destroy you based on price it's really that simple when you have really strong compelling statements that support the questions you're asking you differentiate yourself by explaining how you solve their problem better than everybody else that you're competing with Now I'm not saying this is going to work 10 out of 10 times. That's impossible. Never would we expect to sell every customer we get in front of. But the right customers who have very high risk scenarios in their business if we don't perform or somebody who wants to build a backyard swimming pool um needs to maybe hear about how we future proof their investment by building the swimming pool property to last for 25 years or if it's a weekly landscape maintenance customer maybe we should be explaining to them that we can do a little bit more and spend a little bit more but give them a huge return on their investment by really changing the value of their home with what we do or you know maybe we could differentiate ourselves by bringing really powerful sales tools along with us like an incredible portfolio that 
really helps them see what makes us different. When we're selling design, for example, we're showing our designs and we're showing the products that or that the projects that come from those designs. And I think oftentimes this difficulty in differentiating from competitors is the weak link. The best companies create incredible, compelling statements that really differentiate them from everybody else. Um, just like when we go out and buy cars, you know, you could go to the Volkswagen dealer and buy a perfectly good car that's going to uh, look at and operate the way you expect now and for many years to come. Or you could go over to the Porsche dealer and buy a premium car. There's buyers for both Volkswagens and Porsche cars. We all know that. When we figure out which type of customer we have, we decide what to sell them. These questions that we ask allow us to then sell them the right product. And now, if you sell Volkswagens and Porsches in your landscape business, obviously not cars, but uh, service levels, you have that opportunity when you ask the right question. Because once you figure out what the value driver is for them, then you can sort of pivot and really sell them in a more customized way. And I think that's what the key um, takeaway is when creating compelling power questions is finding a way to differentiate yourself very, very clearly from the pack, because otherwise you will always be that contractor complaining about price. Um, another big problem, I think, without having good power questions and power statements is, you know, a, a, a lack of awareness of what the decision making process looks like. This one's really important if you're selling commercial, obviously. Um, many, many salespeople make the mistake of not knowing who the decision maker is or what the decision making process looks like. And I think in the in not knowing this, they make some mistakes in the way that they present the pricing, the way that they ask for follow up meetings, the way that they set a timeline. And I think ultimately, uh, the way that they really sort of drive urgency in the entire um, process. It's very important that you find ways to differentiate based on the ICP for each ICP and that you can really truly understand that you can differentiate yourself by understanding the design or sorry, the decision making process and then trying to be involved in it without overpowering it. And what I mean by this is if it's a commercial cu customer, for example, maybe you're dealing with a frontline person who is walking you around the facility, showing you what needs to be done, but ultimately they're not making the decision. It's okay once you figure that out to ask for a meeting with the decision maker, to let them know that you'd love to present the proposal either over Zoom on a web meeting or in person to explain your proposal and also um, provide flexibility where needed. Uh, I think it's very important to get the opportunity to present pricing. And you always have to highlight when you're asking for that meeting that there is flexibility in the way that you do business. And it's very important that when you present proposals, you get the opportunity to, to talk about it because maybe it's just not quite the right way of doing business. And so without the, the, the compelling power questions, you miss that opportunity. And I think many, many times contractors just simply create a price based on what they think the customer wants the price to look like. And there's a miscommunication between what the customer is expecting and what the contractor prices. And then they just pick the price based on whoever understood them best. And it, what a shame to be losing great business because you're misunderstanding the needs that uh, I think happens a lot more to most businesses. So one question I want to, you to sit with today is how often have you missed out on a big opportunity because you didn't understand the need well enough to put a proposal together that was compelling for them to move forward? It's a, it's a question worth really thinking about. How often have you misunderstood the needs and not put a proposal together that just hit the mark and really 
talked to that prospect in a way where they felt like you were going to solve their problem. I think that's an important one. Uh, inability to create urgency. Obviously, without these questions, we don't even really understand when they want things done or what's important to them. So it gets it's very difficult for us to kind of move the sale along. And I think when we're um, slow to move sales along, we really, really impact our likelihood to close uh, more than anything else. We want to be quick. We want to keep the urgency on. And let's face it, as a salesperson, you don't want too many opportunities in your pipeline because it gets really difficult to stay on top of everything. So we want to shorten the sales cycle, create the sense of urgency and move people through to the next stage as quickly as possible. Super important. Missed opportunities in general, but definitely a missed opportunity to understand the need well enough to sell them more upfront or even potentially sell them something else that they didn't really call for. Um, again, maybe somebody's calling on us to build them a beautiful backyard um, landscaping project. But while we're there, we notice the rest of the property is poorly maintained. And if you are doing um, weekly services as well as install, there's an incredible opportunity there to sell both. And you'd be shocked at how often I've heard landscape companies who do both services and have unique sales teams for both say that, you know, the design build salespeople don't even put together proposals for recurring maintenance often when they finish a project, which is always very surprising because it's such a big opportunity. And we've already built the rapport and the trust, particularly if they decided to use us. Um, we need to get that other proposal in front of them. And I think often when we don't really have these conversations pre-planned and we don't have great questions that we try to roll through and train our staff to roll through, I think we miss a lot of opportunity. And if somebody else is better at doing this, again, the prospect feels like they were more understood. Everybody's looking for this one-stop shopping experience. And if you're kind of missing the mark and not sharing all you have to offer, I think you missed a lot of opportunities. Um, again, objections are one of these things where, you know, they, they come out throughout the conversation. They're not always right at the last minute. Compelling power questions are designed to bring the objections to the surface throughout the conversation rather than allowing them to build and hit after you give somebody a proposal. Everybody that spent that parts with money has to check a, a list of things off before they decide to trade their money for a service or product. Now, what we're trying to do here is figure out what it is that we need to um, address as early as possible. And so when you have ICPs, you actually build this into your questions and your compelling answers or compelling statements to make sure that they understand exactly how you're going to overcome that. So we raise a pain point, then we tell them how we solve it. We raise a pain point, we tell them how we solve it. And that is the point of these power questions as we go through. Again, we want to kind of um, improve uh, the, the, the general conversation and we wanna make sure that they understand exactly how we're gonna solve the problems that they put in front of us. Obviously, without these power questions, we have varied results. So we don't get very consistent close rates. And this is, you know, a lot of sales uh, um, organizations within landscape companies will have people who close 85% of the deals they go out and sell. And then they have other people that are closing like 10%. And if you see that you've got a huge swing in your closing rates, uh, you are missing some sales training for sure. And this isn't uncommon and this happens. You know, Sometimes you've got three really great sellers and they, they know how to sell and you have some turnover and the next thing sales aren't so good. Um, oftentimes, if you're like me, you kind of forget to backtrack. Sometimes you gotta get back to basics. And if we're not really um, arming our teams with the right training, then we can't really expect things to be going well out in the in the sales um, field. So we want to get really consistent so that our close rates are better and our sales performance metrics are better. And ultimately, 
we want to make sure that our salespeople just feel confident when they show up, that they can know, they know what to say and they know what not to say. They know how to bring that pain to the surface and then help the customer understand how we help them. So I'll just rip through a few specific to landscape lighting here. And I'm running a little long here that I didn't realize how long I, <laughs> I had talked. Um, landscape lighting, great little um, niche market, really high revenue per hour. I'm going to rip through a few power questions that would, just as an example for this ICP specifically, you know, how are you going to use um, your outdoor space in the evening? Here, we're just trying to figure out like, hey, are you going to, do you want to look at the backyard from inside or do you want to use it? Do you want to be outside swimming? Are you playing tennis? Who knows what they're doing, right? So we just want to understand them. Then what we're doing, we're moving on to some questions that sort of, get a little more personal. Like, what is it that you'd like to really highlight on the house? What are your favorite things to look at on the house? Is there some beautiful tree that you'd really like to light up? And of course, we're making recommendations along the way here, but we're asking them to get the opportunity to make a recommendation. And so we're just trying to get them talking and then we help them by adding our expertise. Is there any specific areas that you're concerned with for safety or anything that you just like better visibility um, for more of a, um, you know, simple reason like safe um, walking pathways or maybe it's security. There could be something like that. And again, if there's really nothing there, we're fine, but we can talk about how we typically put a few path lights around some dark areas where their guests might be walking into the backyard in the evening for a visit, just to make things a little bit safer. And so we're, we're just trying to build a little um, rapport, position ourselves as an expert. Then we can kind of roll into things like, you know, is, is energy efficiency important? And then our power statement can be, you know, how we choose products that are very efficient and very good for the environment. Then we can kind of come into, expectations around like, hey, what about maintenance? And when we talk about the fixtures and the quality of the fixtures, we can really start to talk about what makes our fixtures so much better than, you know, the ones you'd pick up over at Home Depot and put it on your own. So we, it, it, these questions are designed to give us a power statement opportunity. So we ask the question, they give us an answer. Sometimes it's even fairly short, but then we have a planned response. And that is where these power questions really start to land in a more powerful way. Um, so that's all for this week. I ran a little bit long. I don't have a lot of time for questions, but I don't see any here anyways. Uh, feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn anytime. Next week, I'm going to really talk about connecting power statements back to these compelling questions. And so this is us really finding a way to ask a question and then tell them how we help and how we've helped others in the past solve similar issues. And I think very important that your power statements connect back to these power questions. We'll talk into that in depth next week. Appreciate everybody joining and uh, whether you're uh, Canadian and you just had Canada Day or if tomorrow you're gonna be um, celebrating the 4th of July. I hope you've had an incredible week and uh, summer is definitely kicking off. I know it's hard to uh, be sitting inside listening to me rant and rave here, but thanks for joining and really appreciate uh, your involvement here each week. Have a great day.